Good morning and welcome to Holy Trinity Lutheran Church on this All Saints Day, Sunday, November 7th. I'm Pastor John Polk and I'm coming to you from Holy Trinity Lutheran Church in Northeastern Massachusetts. Today is a day to remember and honor our dear loved ones who are now with all the company of the great saints of the church in heaven. It is good to be with you this morning and I'd like to begin by sharing with you a reading from the Holy Gospel, the Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, Come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, al Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. The Gospel of our Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Creator, from our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and from our Sustainer, the Holy Spirit. Amen. I grew up in a very quiet, proper family, and I get teased a lot about it by my husband, who did not grow up in a very quiet, proper family. Now, what do I mean by quiet and proper? I remember Sunday afternoon dinners, for example. The five of us, my two older brothers and me and my parents, sat in our very formal dining room around the large formal table set with the finest china. And by fine china, I do not mean the American or Japanese kind, but the English kind. For Sunday, we had to dress up, dress slacks and button down shirts, ties on major holidays. And we would have quiet conversation about what was going on for each of us, but more often about things like politics and government and the arts and other snooty things like that. When the conversation lagged, which seemed like most of the time, there would be a lot of silence, uncomfortable silence. My mother would cook the meals, serve the meals, and while the four of us males, my dad and two brothers and I would enjoy a little more proper conversation. And at the end of dessert, my mother would be in the kitchen cleaning up after us. I will say that one of us boys did usually muster up the energy to clear the dirty, fine china dishes and leave them in the kitchen for my mother, and then go back and sit down. So it may not be surprising that I married into families that were not quiet and proper. In my first marriage of 27 years, I, I married into a large, boisterous German family. In my second marriage of going on eight years, I married into a large, boisterous Italian family, or I should say Sicilian family. And I have to say, when I first attended those family dinners on holidays and birthdays and other special occasions, I was absolutely overwhelmed and actually frightened. Gino's family is really, really loud. Everyone talks at the same time, at the top of their voices, yet they all can follow all those conversations all at the same time, and 
And during the time together, there's a huge, shall I say, range of emotions expressed. There's lots of laughter. There's always tears. There's always some anger. There's always lots of love. And <clears throat> it's absolutely chaotic and confusing and wonderful and amazing all at the same time. It's like being on a different planet compared to the planet I grew up on. Have you ever seen the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding? It's just like that. Ian Miller comes from a family like mine, proper and quiet, and he marries Tula Portokoulos, a huge, loud Greek family who has no problems expressing any kind of emotion. Well, that's what I love about this today's story about the raising from the dead of Lazarus. It's like marrying into one of those families because this very short story is filled with references to senses and feelings. First, Mary falls at Jesus' feet and, and we can only imagine the anger in her voice when she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And while she is kneeling, she begins weeping. But not just Mary, everyone around her is weeping. Then we hear that Jesus is greatly disturbed and deeply moved, which leads to that famous verse, Jesus began to weep. Or in other translations, Jesus wept. So everyone is crying, and when those gathered question Jesus' authority, again we hear that Jesus is angry. Later, Jesus is thankful, and then with great urgency and passion, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. <coughs> Excuse me. But the verse that usually gets overlooked when it comes to sensory overload is this passage in verse 39. And though I rarely turn to the King James Version when reading Scripture, this one is worth noting. The King James Version of verse 39 goes like this. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, saith unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. Martha calls out, but Lord, he stinketh. What could be more jarring and disturbing and true on this day when we honor our loved ones and, and all the great saints of the church to be reminded in such a vulgar way about what it's really like to be human. Now the Gospel of John is the Gospel of signs. There are seven of them and <coughs> And the raising of Lazarus is the last and ultimate sign revealing Jesus' identity as the Christ. But as much as this sign is about Jesus, it's also about us. Because we are all Lazarus. And yes, the truth is that we all stinketh. If we didn't stinketh, just imagine what this world would be like. If we didn't stinketh, there wouldn't be such a huge gap between the rich and the poor. If we didn't stinketh, we wouldn't need to provide lunch every week and dinner once a month to those who are homeless. If we didn't stinketh, this horrible pandemic may not have cost over 750,000 lives in this country alone. If we didn't stinketh, school children would not have to be doing live shooter drills. If we didn't think that we would elect our representatives in Washington, those elected representatives may actually get something done constructively to help people. If we didn't stinketh, global warming would not be costing so many lives and so much property due to excessive wildfires and droughts and floods. If we didn't stinketh, it wouldn't be so hard. It wouldn't seem so futile at times to try to create the beloved community. 
As much as we might resist this smelly description of ourselves, I invite you to put yourselves in the shoes of, or yet better, better yet, in the tomb of Lazarus himself. For we are all Lazarus. There he is, dead, lifeless, lying in his grave, bound up and wound up tightly with the bandages of his brokenness. brokenness. And yes, he begins to stinketh. Don't you at times feel bound up and wound up by your own expectations of yourself or the expectations of others? Don't you at times feel bound up and wound up by what you could be doing, what you want to be doing rather than the reality of what you have to get done every day? Don't you at times feel wound up and bound up by the pressures on you, the lack of time for yourself, and the drive to keep your head up and moving forward? Don't you at times feel wound up and bound up by your own insecurities, by your own perceived shortcomings? The reality is, like Lazarus, we stinketh. Until, until Jesus calls us out of the tomb until he orders everything that binds us down and winds us up to be stripped off and tossed aside, until he breathes his whole breath into us again and we walk out of that tomb. But notice, notice another important detail about this story that changes everything. Yes, it is true that Jesus orders the strips of cloth to be unwound and removed from Lazarus, but notice that Jesus does not do it himself. He does not physically remove the bandages himself. Rather, he tells the people around Lazarus to do it themselves. The people unwrap Lazarus. The people unbind Lazarus. The people free Lazarus. So look at your neighbor. Take time to look. Really look at those who are in some sort of tomb, some sort of prison, like those entombed by addiction, or those entombed by poverty, or those entombed by oppressive governments, or those entombed in refugee camps. How could you, how could we help to unwrap him, to free her, to be all that God intends us to be. It's our job. It's our calling to be the ones to do the work on the ground to set people like Lazarus free. To set people free from whatever binds them up and wounds them up. Jesus is not going to do it himself. No, rather, we on this side of the resurrection are the body of Christ. We are the ones to lead others out of their tombs. We are the ones to wash them clean of that awful stench with the waters of baptism. So shall we, in the words of our hymn of the day, shall we gather at the river? Shall we hose each other down with the cleansing, refreshing, clean water of Jesus? Yes, Yes, we'll gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river that flows by the throne of God. Amen.